Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, this is John McDougal. I am the event coordinator here at Murder by the Book in Houston. And before we get into tonight's event, I just wanted to give you a little update on us at the store, what's going on with us, um, all of that stuff. So we have slowly started to do in-store events again. We had two this week. We had Kristen Bird, who was a local Houston author, in on Tuesday. We had Greg Hurwitz last night. Uh, tonight, we're super excited to have Stephanie Barron chatting with Lauren Willig. And then tomorrow night, I'm going to be back with Mia Manansala and Kelly Garrett talking about Mia's new wrist release. Um, and then if you are historical fiction fans, which I'm guessing you probably are if you were tuning in tonight, next Tuesday, I'm going to be chatting with Deanna Rayburn about the newest uh, Veronica Speedwell book, The Impossible Imposter, which I am reading right now. Um, so I'm super excited to get to chat with Deanna. So I hope that you guys will tune back in for that as well. Uh, if you check out the website murderbooks.com, you will see that events are listed either as in-store or virtual. Um, and it's going to be a mix of both of them for a while. Uh, some publishers have blanket policies about sending people out. Some publishers have policies about sending out certain authors and they're leaving it up to kind of authors to decide. So we don't have a full in-store event calendar and I'm guessing it'll probably be a while before we actually have one of those to be kind of hybrid for a while. Um, I did want to mention too that if you do come to one of the in-store events, we are requiring masks for them. If you've been to our events, you know that the seating area is small and we want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable over there. So we are requiring masks for our events. Um, but uh, if you were tonight while Lauren and um, Stephanie are chatting, if you have questions for either of them about uh, their newest books, previous books, writing process, any of that, you can drop those in the live chat on YouTube or the comments on Facebook, and we will get to those in a little bit. But for now, I'm going to bring our authors out. I am going to start with Lauren Willig. How are you tonight, Lauren? Hi, John. I'm doing very well. Thank you. It's good to see you. I know it's so lovely to be at Murder by the Book, even if only on the screen, but I can pretend we're there in person. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, one of the, one of the nice things about the virtual event stuff is that we get to see you a little bit more often than we would if you were traveling. But the downside is we don't get to give you a hug when you show up. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. I mean, pluses and minuses. I think it's lovely the way you know, we get to get together with people we wouldn't otherwise have seen like Stephanie mm -hmm. Barron, because she and I are across the country free from each other. But this makes it possible for us to be in the same room. Yeah, it's been really fun to, to get to do that and be to kind of help when publicists set stuff up to, and ask them, you know, do you have people in mind for conversation partners and get to, you know, either think of like ideas of like, oh, I think these people would get along really well. Or somebody's like, oh, this other author is my friend. I would love to chat with them. So it's been really fun to get to do all of these different pairings over the last couple of years. And you also get an idea of how good everyone's Wi-Fi is. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, there have been many an event where I am done and I have stress sweated through whatever I'm wearing because people or myself don't have reliable internet connections. Well, I think it was what, a murder by the book that Tasha and Deanna and I were together and poor Tasha kept freezing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. They have. Um, they don't have such great cell service in Wyoming. <laughs> Um, so Lauren's most recent release was the um, paperback of Band of Sisters. Actually, I say was, it actually comes out uh, March 1st. So that's her, her upcoming recent release. And for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, Lauren Willig is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of 20 novels, including The Summer Country, The Ashford Affair, and The English Wife, as well as the Rita Award winning Pink Carnation series. An alumni of Yale University, she has a graduate degree in history from Harvard and a JD from Harvard Law School. She lives in New York City with her husband, kindergartner, toddler, and various quantities, I'm sorry, vast quantities of coffee. Uh, tonight, she is going to be chatting with us with Stephanie Barron, whose newest book is uh, Jane in the Year Without a Summer, and it is the newest in her Jane Austen series. So let's bring Stephanie out. How are you tonight, Stephanie? Hi, I'm good. How are you, John? I'm How good. Thank you, Lauren? Good. Thanks so I much for doing this. Oh, it's such a treat to be at Murder by the Book. You know, I think I signed my first Jane Austen mystery with you back in 1996. Oh, wow. Yeah, Dean, Dean James was still working there. So, I mean, that gives you an idea <laughs> how long ago it was. But this series has been going on for 28 years. So wow. it's, um, it's, it's a treat to be back. Yeah, we, we miss Dean. He doesn't live in Houston anymore. He lives in Mississippi, but we email and, and chat back and forth a lot. Like we, we send him giant boxes of books. Of course, uh, yours, Stephanie, newest one in the box. So we send him big giant boxes of books all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so he has such a taste. 
Yeah. As I mentioned, uh, Stephanie's newest book is Jane in the Year Without a Summer. Uh, it is the 14th in the Being a Jane Austen Mystery series. Officially, uh, Stephanie Barron was born in Binghamton, New York, uh, the last of six girls. She attended Princeton and Stanford Universities, where she studied history before going on to work as an intelligence analyst at the CIA. Uh, she wrote her first book in 1992 and left the agency a year later. Since then, she has written 29 books, including the critically acclaimed Mary Folger series, and she, uh, which she writes under the name Francine Matthews, and she lives and works uh, in Denver, Colorado. So as I mentioned, as uh, Lauren and Stephanie are chatting this evening, if you guys have questions for either of them, please post those in the comments um, on Facebook and YouTube, and we will get to them in a little bit. But for now, Lauren, I'm going to turn this chat over to you, and I will see you guys in just a little bit. Great. Bye, John. Well, this is such a treat. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, this series has been going on for a very long time. And I first made its acquaintance back when I was a baby grad student, when I used to haunt the bookshelves in Wordsworth books, looking at the paperback racks, you know, because before the internet, before author web pages, in the desperate hope that there would be a new Jane Austen mystery out. I remember the first, the unpleasantness at Scargrave Manor. And then after that, just waiting desperately to to see if a new one would come out because there was nothing else like this series. Um, I mean, that was the heyday of Chicklet. You had all of the sort of Jane knockoffs, but they were taking the spirit of it and Bridget Jonesifying it. There was nothing else that really went back to the heart of Austin's own work and personality the way these books do. And so I know you've answered this five zillion times, but I have to ask you, what made you think of it? Why why Jane and why Jane is detective? Well, uh, first of all, why Jane? Because it is a separate issue from why Jane is detective and why Jane is because I was pregnant. And um, I found pregnancy a really hallucinatory experience. I had this um, constant mind freeze and I would do things like, you know, um, go to the food store and, and get the groceries and check out and then leave them in the store and then go back for them and then bring them back leave them behind my car and back into the cart. You know, I mean, I was just, I was a complete mess that whole year. And one of the things I was doing was reading Austin to sort of calm my head. And um, I started to hear her voice, which I also think was, you know, purely pregnancy, but. Or maybe not. Or maybe not. Uh, and I, it got so persistent that I, I was really speaking in what I call Austinese, you know, which is that, early 19th century, passive voiced, um, very constrained construction, <clears throat> um, narrative voice of, you know, my husband would say, uh, what'd you do today when he'd get home from work? And I'd say, well, you know, it being evident the weather should continue fine. We determined upon a pleasure party to the lake. <laughs> um, and your and husband said, it just became okay. that, that constant. And I thought, you know, I've got to use this somehow because what hits me about the language of Austin, and, and I'm sure you know you appreciate this yourself, that um, <clears throat> it has such complexity and multiple meanings operating, particularly in her dialogue. Um, you can unpack her on her dialogue for four separate levels of meaning that filter down and resonate in a conversation that that's going on between two of her main characters, like Lizzie Bennet and Darcy. Um, and I loved the richness of that, and I wanted to use it. Um, in an era when, you know, so much of our dialogue conveys very little, it's sound bites, it's tweets, it's um, texts, and there's there's no, it's all surface. So I thought, well, okay, you know, I found the language of Austin intimidating when I first read her when I was 12. Um, and it can be, it can seem inaccessible. So I thought, you know, if I gave people a compelling plot, maybe they'd be sucked into the language and submit to it willy-nilly, you know, <laughs> and not even know they were enduring that language um, because they were hunting for a body. So I thought it would be a great, fun vehicle. Um, but but I also thought that Austin herself made a great detective for the simple reason that, you know, what what's enduring about her literature, Lauren, is, as you know, her profound sensibility about human motivation. You know, she understands the human heart. She understands the way we deceive others, the way we curate our self-presentation. That's all of her villains are beautiful creatures who present themselves in the most seductive light possible 
Um, and the women in the stories are the detectives. They have to, you know, use this limited information to penetrate, that's a very Austin word, penetrate the mystery of the man in front of them who could determine whether they'll be happy or miserable for the rest of their lives. And so she understood these sort of shifting masks and how people manipulate to get what they want. Um, and she lived in a period of time when all policing was informal. There, were, there was no police force in 1810 England. Um, there were magistrates and they were appointed by the Lord Lieutenant of the county. So the gentry of the county administered the justice system. And she knew this intimately because her elder brother Edward was a magistrate in Canterbury. He was a justice of the peace. He took her through the Canterbury jail in 1805. And so she had this sort of intimate knowledge of the informal justice system that was pervasive in England at the time. And uh, I just thought she was uniquely positioned to, in a world of amateur detectives, operate with her sensibility and her male networks. Um, she had five brothers. She had six, actually, but one was in care his whole life. But the other five brothers gave her amazing access to like every strata of, you know, British society. The one was a, a member of the gentry and married to a baronet's daughter and administered his states. The other was a clergyman. She had two brothers who were post captains in the Royal Navy. And that comes out really heavily in Persuasion, her novel, her last novel. Um, and she had a brother who was a banker who gave her access to London. She would go visit Henry. He was her favorite brother. And, um, he was the one who was really extroverted, had the glittering French wife, French raised wife, um, and was a lender of money to the Prince Regents set at Carlton House. So, you know, glittering, glamorous London, Jane had access to that. And he also helped her get published. So when she was doing things like reading proofs of her novels, she'd go stay with Henry and visit her publisher in the way that, you know, I would shack up with you to visit my New York publisher. <laughs> I mean, it really is fascinating how she had windows into all of these different walks of life. And something that struck me so much reading her letters is how much freer her life is then we impose backwards upon it that we have, I think, this very retroactive idea of her life as being confined to the drawing room. It's that idea of Aunt Jane. But I mean, there she is. She's going to parties. She's constantly traveling. There's right. more than one flirtation that almost turns into an engagement. And yeah. I mean, she really has so much scope. Yeah. Part of it is, you know, interestingly, I think, because she was in that place in society that was almost in between. She wasn't established as a wife of someone notable. She was the child of a clergyman, which made her genteel, but not wealthy. So she was shabby genteel, um, dependent, but freer because she didn't have to fill a codified role as a woman in her society. She could just sort of be herself. She could write. She could, And her family, because of their penury and their dependence and their loss of her father in 1805, um, and as a result, as a clergyman, he had the living, he had the house when he died, the living, which was his parish salary, and his home passed to her elder brother, James, who inherited the living and the house, sort of not inherited, that's the wrong word, but succeeded to both. Um, they were suddenly itinerant, all the women in the family. It's kind of like the beginning of Sense and Sensibility, when Eleanor and Marianne Dashwood and their mother are kicked out by her brother from their home. And they have to suddenly shift for themselves. They have to find a place to live. They can't have horses. They can't have a big house. They have no furniture there. I mean, it's the whole thing that happened to Jane, Cassandra and their mother. And, um, but that also gave her freedom to invent herself as this writer, to say no to marriage, to say, I'm not gonna die in childbirth like four of my five sisters-in-law did. Um, and forge a, a, an independent path. And that is one of the fascinating things about her that I love. Um, because they move so often, the books in the series are, are peripatetic. You know, there's some set in Derbyshire, there's some set in Southampton, there's some set in Kent, in Canterbury, there's some set in London. There are two and, sets. And uh, one in Gloucestershire. Yes, yeah, at, at Cheltenham Spa. Um, 
where she spent two weeks because she was starting to become ill in 1816. Um, and it's a real little tiny snippet of her life that's not well documented because she was traveling with her sister, Cassandra. And, you know, so much of the basis of her knowledge of Jane Austen derives from her collected letters. And she didn't write to Cassandra when she was with her. So, you know, there's no extant record of those two weeks in May, late May, early June in, in 1816. Did you so, find, did that make it harder or did it make it easier? You know, that's happened a bunch in the series. Some of the books are absolute mosaics of letters that are written from a specific time and place. Um, an example of that is uh, Jane and the Gentleman Rogue, whatever. The book. Jane, and, Jane and the Man on the Cloth, the second book. This is so bad when you can't remember your own titles, but it happens. Um, I, you know, I'm that age where I, menopause is starting to make me forget also things. Pandemic brain. Yeah, that too. Um, so, so Jane and the Man on the Cloth, who was also called the Gentleman, the Gentleman of the Night were the smugglers on the Cornish and the, the Channel Coast. Um, that book is a mosaic of letters she wrote from Lyme Regis, which is where she later set Pride and Prejudice. And every person she mentions is in the book as a character. Um, she mentions people like the town coroner. He, he, he's a doctor who comes to see her because she has a cold, but it turns out he was also the coroner of Lyme at the time. So she actually met the coroner. You know, that was so useful for me. Um, she mentions the day she went bathing at Charnmouth. Uh, she mentions what her mother lost in which card games at with which players. So I had this template for the whole week and I used it. Other books um, fall into a gap in the letters where her sister Cassandra, as she aged after Jane's death, started to become the editor of their joint lives. And, um, you know, it's kind of sad. She, You were talking about the freedom of, of Jane and the Regency as we know, was more, much freer as an, as an era. Cassandra lived on to the Victorian period and became very um, conscious of the ways in which Jane was too free, too vulgar, too viciously funny. Too Georgian. <laughs> too Georgian. Too Georgian, exactly. And, you know, destroyed some of the letters. She also cut passages out of letters with her needlepoint scissors. Um, and so uh, I like to fill those gaps with fiction. So, so I've done both. But in the case of the Cheltenham book, there was a wonderful article written uh, and submitted to the British Jane Austen Society notes um, that, that tracked the, the two weeks she was in Cheltenham, where she probably stayed, you know, where build it, certain buildings were, with whom she might have interacted. And um, that proved really useful for me. So were you able to then use that as the scaffolding onto which to build? I did. Plus, you know, you know, Lauren, 1816. So this, the year without summer is 1816. Which it's, has to be one of the best titles ever. I mean, it's brilliant because it encapsulates <laughs> so much. I mean, it gives such a sense of the aura and the atmosphere and sort of the gloom that encases both the country and Jane's own life at the time. Oh, and ours, ours. I mean, you know, it was such a pandemic book to write. I, I wrote this during the height of the pandemic and the parallels were just ghastly. Um, so you stole so my question. I was going to ask you about that. What it was like writing this during the pandemic. Yeah, it was um, cathartic. It was very cathartic because, it, you know, it drove home to me. So first of all, the year without a summer in 1816 and in, in European, actually world history, um, has come down to us because there was, as there was in Tonga last week, a volcanic eruption in Indonesia. And in this case, it was 1815, Mount Tambora. And it was the most violent volcanic eruption in recorded human history. Um, and that's a caveat, you know, we've only been recording since probably the, the 18th century. So it's hard to, but the most violent that we've, we've had in 300 years. And, um, it created this dust cloud that was global and had this enormous climactic impact. And um, as a result, there was a frost fair in, in London in 1815 and the Thames froze and it was one of the last frost fairs, which was a very festive kind of thing. Um, 
but the spring was still born. The crops died in the fields. Uh, the result was famine throughout Europe, and there was even famine in the United States because this was a global phenomenon. Um, the British economy had taken a hit because of the end of the Napoleonic Wars, which occurred in 1815 with Waterloo. The whole British economy had been driven and motored by this wartime supply and demand um, that fell apart very suddenly, abruptly, and was combined with all these men coming back from war who suddenly had no jobs. And so there were there was unemployment, there was inflation, <laughs> there were bank failures. Jane's brother, Henry, the glamorous Londonite, completely lost his banking empire, which was three banks throughout England. And he was a military paymaster. So part of why he failed was because all these men came back and they wanted to cash out and they wanted all their money. And, you know, at the time, if you were a soldier or a Navy person, you weren't paid on a weekly basis. You were kind of paid in yearly. <laughs> so this sudden influx of people wanting their money crashed the system. Um, the famine that resulted from the, the horrific weather meant that by 1816, there were breads, uh, starvation, that, which revolt against industrialization and they brought out the troops and killed people who were protesting. So there was just a horrible atmosphere in England at this time and they never had a summer. There was the weather continued to be just terrific uh, and it felt really apocalyptic in England at that time. So you know it was weird to to write this during the pandemic and think about quarantining and isolation and uh, one of the famous images of this time in England, is that Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein in the in the year the summer of 1816 because she had fled England with Percy Bysshe Shelley and her sister Claire Claremont and they're sitting at a rented villa on Lake Geneva with Lord Byron and the weather's so yeah as one does uh, and the weather's so horrible that they can't go out and enjoy themselves on the lake and they sit around the fire in July telling ghost stories and that's where Frankenstein is born so really epical year. Um, and, and in the Austin family, it was even worse because um, Henry's bank fails. He actually has to sell his personal belongings in his apartment in Covent Garden, Henrietta Street, uh, public sale, and comes home destitute. I think he has like, you know, a few shillings in his pocket to live with his mother and his spinster sisters at Chawton Cottage, their house. Um, her brother Charles loses his ship in a hurricane in the Mediterranean and is hauled before the Admiralty Board for dereliction of duty. And her eldest brother Edward, who's kind of the rock, he's not her second eldest brother. Eldest brother James is a clergyman um, and she didn't much love him. But Edward, her second eldest brother, who's the Kentish noble, you know, gentry married to the daughter of a baronet, landed estates, the whole thing. He's being sued by their neighbors for um, unlawful inheritance. They want his inheritance. And uh, he eventually settles for, you know, this vast sum of like 15,000 pounds, which would be like $1.5 million now. Um, so everybody's having just a hell of a year. <laughs> and, and Jane. Yeah. And Jane's starting to get sick. Yes. So it's a really interesting period to, you know, to set a book um, for me. Who, because the whole context of her life has been really critical to this series. The books are standalone and, and each of them involves a particular place, a particular time in British history, and of course, a particular murder. Um, and it's but, fascinating the tones of the individual books while remaining entirely um, Jane, do you change to reflect their setting? Mm -hmm. and, well, I guess also in the old different epochs of her life. I mean, your early books have a much lighter tone. This one felt so much more serious in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't, don't you find that when you're writing a series that you evolve in oh, a absolutely. deeper way? And the characters you know. take over and they, they direct the tone mm -hmm. and the trajectory of the book. Mm -hmm. And you, know, in this case, I was wondering really how how do you manage it with the elephant in the room with Jane's illness? You know, was that very hard to write about, knowing what we know now, or were you able to blot out the hindsight and 
get into her mindset at the time? Yes and no. Uh, I think I give... So when you, you've read her letters, and so you know that she was working through being sick herself. She was trying to figure it out as she went. And it begins pretty much in March of 1816. And she dies in July 1817. And I have to write that book. And that's going to be the much harder job to to manage for me. Um, the Poirot's last case. I mean, how yeah. did you wind up something like this that you've been working on for so long where you're so attached, but you know it has to end? But you've done that yourself with the Pink series. Although I don't, I think I guess what you're saying is that it's different when your character dies. I mean, unless you pull a Sherlock Holmes and bring him back from the Reichenbach Falls. And in this mm -hmm. case, of course, because she's a historical figure, <laughs> that would be an amazing spinoff. The Jane faked death. I mean, she really, she reappears on the continent under an assumed right. name. And you have a whole new life for, you know, Jane's second act. Right, right. She's, she's on the see how Jane navigated the, you know, the Victorian era. That would be fascinating, hearing her pithy comments on all the prudery. <laughs> it would. When the, she would have to do it from, from the safety of Paris, where life is I much just, more safe. Can you just see her at the court of Louis, I'm sorry, what am I saying, of Napoleon II? Right, uh, right. Not, Napoleon III, my brain Eugenie, 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 yeah. Napoleon III, mm -hmm. yes, Napoleon. Right, yeah. No, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. But I, um, to get back to your question, I think what I have her trying to do in this book is take care of her family and their perception of her illness, which I think she would have done, shield them from her full extent of suffering. Um, and we should say, for those who don't know, that that it's conjectured that Jane had Addison's disease, um, which is similar to diabetes in that diabetes is about insulin insufficiency and the regulation of sugar in the bloodstream. Addison's is about adrenal insufficiency, which is the kidneys and the regulation of sodium in your bloodstream, sodium levels. So it's as critical as insulin in your system and as impactful when it's off and not working. Um, and so it caused her to feel backaches, nausea, have digestive problems, hence going to Cheltenham because people went to spas to take mineral waters, uh, in this case, iron rich, or they called them chalibiate waters. And the iron was supposed to help your digestive tract. Um, it was probably just really emetic and awful, but- uh, um, It sounds vile. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sulfurous, uh, the whole nine yards, saline, I mean, just god awful, disgusting water, but they would drink it religiously and then they'd be purged and they'd feel lighter and they'd think they were healthy. So anyway, um, she's Again. trying to attack it from that viewpoint. You know, one of the interesting things that I kind of pursued as I was researching this book was why this, why this disease, why now? Um, other people have said, well, maybe she had pancreatic cancer. Maybe she had Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I remember possibly. reading ages ago, breast cancer was one possibility given. No, she knew breast cancer really intimately because Henry's mm -hmm. wife, Eliza, died of it. Mm -hmm. So she knew what that looked like and felt like and how it ended. Mm -hmm. um, it really was clearly pancreatic, liver focused or adrenal, her kidneys. Um, but it was so rapid. You know, so I had researched Addison's um, for a different book I wrote as Francine Matthews called Jack 1939, which is about Jack Kennedy as a 22 year old in 1939. Uh, and it's a, it's a espionage novel, so I won't go into all of that. But of course he had Addison's um, and it was undiagnosed until 1946 because the knowledge of hormonal disorders was really uh, scant up until about the 1940s, he started self-medicating on the advice of doctors at the Mayo Clinic with these like lozenges of, of steroids that he would, he would cut his thigh muscle and put the steroid disc into his thigh and it would dissolve over time for several days. And then about, you know, a week later he'd do it again. And people at Harvard remember him as an undergrad 
having these sort of cuts in his leg where he'd do this. So it was a gross dosage of steroids that was kind of inexact, ill-targeted, mm -hmm. um, imprecise. And it's what leached all the calcium out of his spine, which is why he ended up by, by PT-109 period having such a fragile spine that he couldn't, he was medically discharged from, from the Navy in World War II, and that haunted him the rest of his life. Long story short, his Addison's was present his whole life, and it was never fully, you know, he was misdiagnosed as having leukemia at 17, and um, all the symptoms were hard for doctors to figure out, but it was lifelong, it was chronic. Um, Jane's case came on, you know, at 40, and she was dead by 41 and a half. So that intrigued me, and I thought, well, you know, what... Why would Addison's, if it was Addison's, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was pancreatic cancer, which has a swift arc. But anyway, I just sort of went and looked at, tried to see if there was any research that correlated menopause and Addison's and stumbled over this 2002 NIH study that showed that if you have early onset menopause, which is defined as 40 or younger, you are 300 times more likely to develop Addison's disease. And I thought, bingo. Yeah. <laughs> and do, do we have no, any record of whether Jane had early onset menopause? Is, are, is there any clue? She never ever discusses that in her letters that I can see. And the letters are kind of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's pure conjecture and it could be wildly off the mark, but um, it just I just found it intriguing. It's a good theory. I mean, it matches, I love the way in your author's note, at the end, you match up her symptoms with it. Yeah. Yeah, they do kind of match up. Um, but, you know, it's such an interesting period. You, you've read so much in this period that you know. Um, if you were a woman in, in Georgian England and the Regency all the way up through the 1880s, you were not a person. You were either your you know, father's property or your husband's property. And part of this um, infantilization of women was present in the medical system. So doctors would tell women, well, you know, you are subject to the humors of the uterus. This is where the word hysteria comes from. Um, women were hysteric. They were influenced and controlled and debilitated by their uterus which made them lesser than the male sex. And of course you, you would sap your future childbearing power if you read too much or yes. studied because yes, that will affect your uterus. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't learn too much. You couldn't be too active. You couldn't control anything. You couldn't have <laughs> the life of a man because you would fall apart. And in fact, they actually linked it to insanity and you could be institutionalized for your hysteria. Um, so the whole issue of women's health is very fraught. It's burdened by social and political implications. Um, it's a separate form of medicine socially in a way that male, more general medical um, practice was not. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the really interesting things that I kind of encountered in, in looking at the sort of women who ended up at spas um, was that if you didn't want to be subject to male control and viewed only as a childbearing woman, you fought back by not having children. And one of the ways you did that was by becoming anorexic. So if you refused to eat if your nerves were so disordered that you could not stomach food, you would lose weight to the point where you could not bear a child. And then you were in total control of your body. And so there's this fascinating conjunction between nervous disorders, spa treatments, drinking the waters, fertility, and self-control, you know? And you read up in this and you're kind of like, wow, this is parallel to the whole argument we still have today about women's control over their bodies and who gets to dictate that. But because the power had to be internalized for women in Jane's era, 
you denied sex to somebody, you denied food to yourself, um, or you died in childbirth, you know, <laughs> like four of her sisters in law did. So it's it's just a really complex issue. Um, well, it's an interesting balance. I mean, when you think about it, you can make yourself ill and thereby regain some control, but then you're putting yourself into the power of a male doctor. Exactly. Where do you, how do you keep that balance? And that's something you explore so well in this book. And you're also putting yourself potentially into the, to the, the uh, situation of being institutionalized mm -hmm. because you're so neurotic, you're refusing food, you know? And, and so it's, um, I don't know. I just find the whole, the other route of course was laudanum. Women would just drug themselves with laudanum. Uh, or be drugged. Or be drugged. Yes. Yes. And that was a way of controlling them. Um, so yeah, those, a lot of those themes are in this book, I think. And um, they, they're not always explicit, but at other times they are in the book. Yes. Now, I mean, that, that theme really carry, I don't want to give any spoilers, but you use that to such good effect. I see we're almost at the 40 minute mark. So I want to ask before. How we is that possible? Have I, I just been know. chattering on? I'm so sorry. I think we talk about Jane forever. <laughs> um, but so I did want to ask, though, before we hand it over to audience questions, um, where does Jane go next? Can you tell us? Well, so the next year in her life, realistically, is very housebound. Because she's getting. So I imagine that places a lot of constraints on what you can do with the next book. Um, I'm title is Jane and the Winchester Schoolboy. Hmm. And of course she died in Winchester. Um, but her nephew was at Winchester School um, College and um, which was a prep school, you know, for the gentry. Um, so I want to have Winchester be the lo locus of the next book, but I don't want it to be solely about her dying. That's all I'll say. Yes, but well, that something I think you handled so beautifully in this book is that it, yes, there was a cloud of doom, but the cloud of doom wasn't Jane's impending demise. It was everything else going on that you still, she is still believably engaging in potential romantic interactions. Um, and I mean, that's part of the brilliance of this series is that there have been, you get us into Jane's present so well that even though I know Jane never marries, there have been so many times through the course of this series where I have mm. waited for that happily ever after moment because it seems so possible. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's tough to deal with the reality that we all want happily ever afters. And, you know, she was so deft at providing them for her characters in a way that she never realized in her own life. Yes. Um, and that's one of the sustaining things about her work that you don't find, I think, in the later Victorian writers, um, you know, the uh, um, Brontes or, or George Eliot, that, that the Victorian sensibility is much more about denied happiness than it is about realized and fulfilled happiness. And so I think that, again, is part of why we go back to Jane. Um, and I, I kind of have tried to invest her character with that drive because I think it's so triumphant in her work that it has to have been present in her soul. Uh, but you cannot <laughs> deny that it didn't actually happen for her. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a very complex little dance. So I have and a question for you. That's you do so well. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. What was your first encounter with Austin and what's your favorite book? Okay, it's two two questions. <laughs> oh, yeah, the what's my was my first encounter with Austin. It's a tough one. I do remember reading uh, Pride and Prejudice in middle school, and I can't remember what the catalyst was. I was the obnoxious fourth grader who had decided I was going to read The Three Musketeers and Last of the Mohicans and all of those books because they were the grown up books, and I wanted to read that rather than what was in the middle school library. And I remember my father asking me what's the context? And my father is a former historian and telling him, well, it's said in England. And he looked at me, <laughs> no, no, no. It's about the rising gentry or the rising middle class and the embattled gentry. I remember just tuning all of that out and thinking, no, it's not. It's about Elizabeth and Darcy. Darcy. And I remember coming back to it again in upper school when we read it in school and our teacher telling us that 
it's one of those books you read differently at different phases in your life and turning mm -hmm. to my best friend and saying, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, clearly it's the same book. And then about five years after that, reading it again and thinking, oh, now I get it. Now I understand how you read it for different things. So this is one of these books that, I mean, Jane Austen and particularly Pride and Prejudice has been with me for so long. And it's just, but it's one of those few books where I can measure where it was against me as a reader and different yes. bits of my life. But yes. as my favorite, my favorite has always been North and Grabby. You know, sort of really? Being, yes, I, I oh. love it. But you know, and part of that goes back to what you were saying about language and her brilliant, you know, um, stiletto-like use of language, how thinly she slices it. There's that brilliant conversation with Henry Tilney where he calls yes. Catherine out for saying something is nice. And he's like, well, what exactly does that word mean? What do you mean by it? And there's this whole, you know. Precision of language. Yes. 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 Come up with a better word to describe your reality. Yeah. It's that It's that fine honing of experience. Yeah. It's wonderful. My favorite book is Persuasion. So that's the one that I find myself reading. I, I mean, I read Pride and Prejudice all the time. I love it. Because to me, it's a great collection of, of secondary character caricatures. Mm -hmm. It the personalities of those secondary characters is so piquant that you can, you know, you can, they're, they're eternal, but persuasion for me is such a pan yes. to enduring love and lasting commitments and strength of character and quiet persistence and empathy and so many things that uh, it's the most autumnal, but the most to me, you know, resonant, and in its own way, the most optimistic. Yes. That you see them, they've already been through so much hardship. You know that they are going to last. I mean, we leave, of course, you know, with the other couples, we leave, you know, Lizzie and Darcy, and we know Jane and Bingley are going to be cheated by all their servants. That's already <laughs> out there. And, you know, I've always had my doubts about Edward Ferrers and Eleanor and so on. You know, those are, but when we leave Anne and Captain Wentworth, we know this is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My fear always is that she died in childbirth. Oh, goodness. No, that would be entirely <laughs> obsessed with that. Because then, of course, we get to imagine Captain Wentworth as a single father, which I can sadly picture all too well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe, you know, and some silly girl will try to comfort him. Right. Well, wrong. Yes. So, but, uh, John, do we have questions or can we keep rambling? We have questions, but I'm sure we can. I'm sure we can combine the two. So this is a great question. Bobby Joe wants to know, uh, Stephanie, what is the question you would most like to ask Jane Austen if you could meet her? Oh wow, that's a <laughs> great question. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you've been interrogating her for so long. Yeah, I would love to know how she actually really felt about Tom Lafroy. Tom Lafroy is the person that she, at 20, thought she was going to marry. And he was sent off by his aunt with whom he was staying, who was Jane's lifelong mentor and friend, Madame Lafroy, because she was not wealthy enough. And he went back to England and he became a barrister and... Um, named his first daughter, Jane. And I would love to know whether she really was in love with him and it was a Captain Wentworth kind of thing or whether uh, it was just a passing thing. I don't know. I would love to know that. That's, that's trivial. That's not about writing. It's not about survival and endurance, but that's what I'd like to know. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it would tell it tells you so much about her and the shape of her character. Yeah. Right. There's that line in Persuasion where she says of Anne Elliot that she had learned romance as an older woman because she had been forced to practicality as a young one. Um, that I think speaks to that whole episode with Tom Lafroy. How about you, Lauren? Any anything that you would ask Jane Austen if you would ask her a question? I would love to sit down with her 
over drinks or a very strong cup of tea and find out what she thinks about her posthumous reputation. That, you know, especially the whole Jane Austen craze of the 90s, early 2000s, when everything was being attributed to her name. What she thinks of some of the spinoffs of, you know, of Clueless, of Bridget Jones, of all the rest of it. Does she feel that they are true to her or is she saying they're snorting her tea in horror? You know, that's a really good point because, I mean, she's on the British pound, right? Mm -hmm. The 10 pound note. Um, and she would never, ever have conceived that possible. But what I often think, Lauren, when I think about Jane and, and performance and how beautifully her work translates to performance is how she was reared in the theater by her family and Madame Lefroy. Domestic plays, of course, that, but she wrote them too as a kid. And so her sense of performance and of scene is really strong in her fiction. Then I look at film and I think film was a con, you know, electricity. She, she uses the word electricity and electric in um, Northanger Abbey. So she was familiar with the concept, but, she, but the whole idea of film and screens and digitization and eBooks and, TikTok. I mean, my God, stuff. The last Jane Austen um, conference I went to, there was a whole panel on Jane Austen and TikTok. You know, so it just keeps morphing and morphing and morphing. And uh, yeah. And so much has been attributed to her and her, her opinions have been fought over to such a degree. It would be mm -hmm. fascinating to have her step out and clarify. Okay. No, 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 no. That was not what I meant. Right. Going going back to your, your talk about, you know, potentially, you know, having her come back after, you know, going over the falls and having her come back and what she would do. Um, there is an author, uh, Michael Thomas Ford, who did a three book series where Jane is a vampire. And yes, she, I remember and, those. Yes. And she owns a bookstore. So like, I think in the first book, like some person who's come in and written, like who's really snotty and has written this really terrible Jane Austen pastiche comes in and is kind of makes some disparaging part. So Jane just drains her to the point that this woman's just found like wandering senselessly <laughs> down the street after her event. There's so much fun. <laughs> like she finally gets her revenge. Yeah. She sinks her teeth into her revenge. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Lauren, I meant to ask you before we got into crowd questions, you've been so great to lead the conversation tonight. Can you tell everybody a little bit about uh, Band of Sisters? Oh, sure. I mean, sort of yeah. moving to an entirely different time period, <laughs> although I think Jane would have approved. So Band of Sisters is based on the true story of a group of Smith College graduates who went over to France during World War I to bring humanitarian aid to French villagers who had been trapped between the two armies, um, who basically, who had they, their villages had been occupied by the Germans, and they finally got pushed out by the French and British armies, but the Germans had destroyed everything mm -hmm. in the hopes that they would sicken and starve and be a burden on the French war effort. And that might have happened, but there was one Smith grad who was like, clearly, what we need to fix this situation is American college women and a group of people get together and we will go out to this devastated zone right next to the active war zone and the shelling and we'll teach classes for the children and bring cows for milk and rebuild everyone's houses because obviously, and the amazing thing is they did it and it really happened. But the best of it was, um, you know, um, Stephanie and I were talking about Jane's letters and how few there are that most of the time when you read, when you write these books, you're triangulating around absences mm -hmm. and trying to put right. together bits and you're dying to know what really happened. What did this person think of this? What did they do? What did they eat for breakfast that day? And with this book about the Smith College Relief Unit, I had all of these women wrote letters home from the Psalm, um, hundreds and thousands of pages of letters, and they weren't supposed to. Um, they were supposed to go through the census and not say all sorts of things, but they, they got around, they would give packets of letters to guys they knew who were going home and be like, mail this when you get to New York. And so all of this stuff, I mean, it was literally thousands of pages of day-to-day -day multiple viewpoints of the same events, like, so that girl did this. And it just, you know, everyone's dream collection of letters. And that's, so that's Band of Sisters. So can I just mm -hmm. ask you to tell for everybody who's here, how you stumbled on this story. 
you know, <laughs> while I was trying to do something else. So I co-write with two good friends, Beatrice Williams and Karen White. And we were working on a book set during World War One, World War Two, and the 1960s in France. And for the World War One portion, we needed to know, and I know you will appreciate this, this, the ridiculous detail we needed was whether a certain type of Christmas cake would have been served in Picardy under the German occupation. And there I am desperately Googling, you know, Picardy, Christmas, World War One, and I didn't find the Christmas cake, but up popped this memoir by a Smith alum talking about throwing Christmas parties for French villagers right behind the front lines. I was like, this is the most insane thing I've ever read. What would a group of, it has to be fiction, how would Smithies be there in the war zone nine miles from the trenches? This can't have happened, which is always how the best things happen when you're like, this can't be real. And then you find right. out actually it was, it's our perceptions of the past that are wrong. It actually right. happened quite a different way. It's all about how it's curated and, and how we've received what has been allowed to be put down as history, you know? Which is part of, I think, the fascination of watching all the posthumous Janes and what's so amazing about how incredibly um, true to her period your Jane is, because I, I feel like we have definitely gotten those curated Janes who don't sound at all like her letters a lot. Right. Right. That is, it's all, yeah, voices. And you know, from working with letters, the most vivid thing you get from letters is personal voice. You know, when I sat and read Jack Kennedy's letters home in the Kennedy archive from when he was in college, when he was 13 at Choate and he was writing home, um, such an individualized, strong, intimate, it's intimate, the voice. It's not it's not massaged. It's not presented for the public like a speech would be. You know, it's get me a subscription to the New York Times because I didn't even know there was a slump on, he says in 1933. He wanted a subscription to the New York Times because no one had told him there was a depression. You know, and you get this, these, these bursts of personality of what's important, what's vital, of feeling stupid, of feeling humiliated, of feeling, you know, um, of that as prime material, you, it's like career. So, yeah. So as we, as we mentioned, when we got started, when we were doing um, the bio, Stephanie, you also write um, the Mary Folger books as Francine Matthews, and you've done historical thrillers under that name as well. How do you balance jumping back and forth between the kind of very John, I only got half of that question because you froze. Oh, okay. Uh, can you um, hear me now? But I think you were asking, how do I balance different uh, writing in under different names and mm -hmm. genres and so forth? Um, you know, it's it's interesting you should ask that because I just turned in the manuscript of my latest Meredith Folger, um, which was due, I, I turned it in Tuesday. Um, and I don't do anything simultaneously. I, I am a I am a serial writer. <laughs> uh, so there, there's a gap between, I used to do one, one each under each name per year. And then at a certain point, I just stopped doing that because it was, I don't know how, Lauren, you do the three W books and your own simultaneously in a year. I just find that overwhelming and I'm, I'm more power to you. And, and I, I'm so impressed That's because the quality, the quality of all of them is so, so high. Um, but, uh, you know, I, they're compartmentalized in my head. The, the Baron books are, um, they skew more toward the female reader, to be honest, um, in, in my anecdotal sort of data taking, mm -hmm. uh, more men read my Matthews books, whether it be the Nantucket series or my espionage novels. Um, the standalones I've written as Baron are about Queen Victoria, Virginia Woolf, uh, and Vita Sackville West, um, Jenny Churchill, Winston Churchill's American Gilded Age mother. So um, those books are more historical fiction and um, less violent, less gritty than the Matthews books. Uh, and I think it's really helped me to have those distinct names because somebody who's looking for Jane Austen or Jenny Churchill is going to be a little disconcerted by neo-Nazism in Central Europe or, you know, Jack Kennedy or um, I wrote a book about Ian Fleming. 
and World War II. So, you know, they are different kinds of genres. And there are people who read everything I write, which is really gratifying, but um, not everybody. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> No, I love your Mary Folger books. And I think there's actually, there is a bridge there because there is a similar sense that even though the tones are so different and the subject matter is so different, there is a similar sense of piecing to them both. Oh, good. Great. That's good to know. Yeah. The Mary Folger books are um, about a cop on present day Nantucket. So um, they have a police procedural element to them that's very different from anything that else that I write. Uh, but they're very embedded in a sense of community and place. And so that does make them both, you know, police procedural detective stories, but kind of like Shetland with a very marked location and, and atmosphere that, that frames the whole story, I think. So what, think, what carries over all of your books, the historicals, the Janes and the, the, the Folgers is the fascination with character. I mean, you really mm. get into dissecting people's personalities. The psychology comes into it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what makes this person do this thing? And mm -hmm. again, yeah. it's always very like Shetland where you're getting very detailed looks at even the side characters. Everyone has their own personality and that personality is important to the story. Yeah, I think that is actually really critical to me. It's very important to me as a writer, but also it's really important to me as a reader. And I'm sure it is to you too, because your characters are so, you know, we you, it's about backstory. It's about motivation. Nobody arrives as a character in a, in a drama. S sui generis, tabula rasa, no background, no or their cardboard characters. You know, there's always got to be something that has made them the person they are at that particular age in that particular place and time. And um, you as the writer need to know that. The reader discovers it. But if you don't know it, there's nothing there to discover. So, you know, I think that's so much of the work that we do. Yes. And figuring out what it is about that personality that will intersect with the series of accidents or opportunities that will occur to them that will bring them to that crucial point to where you are yes. when Jane comes in or Mary comes in and has to figure out what just happened here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So much fun, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. such a privilege. <laughs> It's a great way to spend your time. <laughs> so I have to ask, I mean, unless you're, there are a lot of other questions queued up, but I would like to, I'd love to abuse my power here by asking, which do you enjoy writing the most? You know, I, I've, I've grown so attached to, to Jane's voice and my relationship with her over 20 odd years that it's very comforting for me to re-enter her world. And I love that period in history. But there's a huge divide between those books and everything else I do, which is simply put, the Jane books are first person point of view. So they're very linear, in my opinion. Everything the reader experiences begins and ends with Jane's observation of it. I don't switch point of view in those books. In that sense, they are simpler to write. The other books I work on are multi-dimensional and the choreography demanded of third person books where you have simultaneity of, of time, of actions occurring in the same time in different parts of the world or the country or even just the town. Um, and you're juggling different points of view. You're juggling what you reveal to the reader um, from certain characters that the detective does not know yet, but the reader does. Um, you're working with the villain and revealing things about that person to the reader that the detective doesn't know. There's all of this intense choreography that goes on, in my opinion, with third person omniscient books. They give you so much power to inhabit different parts of the plot and the novel and the different characters. But if you mismanage that process, the book fails. So to me, the demands of a third person novel make it more engaging for me to write than the sort of more simplistic linear approach of a first person book. That's That to me is the difference between the Janes and everything else. But I love Jane so much and it's been such a journey of 
through time of my own maturation as a woman, you know, I, you were talking about going back to her books. Part of what we go back to is our ourselves and you see your own growth over time. My growth as a writer, um, you know, my growth as a parent, it's all played out against the backdrop for me of the Jane Austen novels. And so they're in intimately tied up in all of that for me. Um, your work is your is your life, you know. So well, we'll start with uh, Stephanie on this one. What is something that you've read lately that you've loved? <laughs> this is really uh, funny, and I, and actually came up with um, Lauren in a previous sit down we had. I've been on this tear of reading Jenny Colgan books, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I started uh, before Christmas. I had not read her before, and she's a Scottish writer who writes women's fiction, but she captures something about the human element of her characters that's very authentic and resonates. So even though the books are light um, and not intellectually taxing, they are very comforting and sustaining. And I think because I was writing a book recently, I try not to read in the realm I am writing um, because I don't want to have a conflicting voice or a conflicting plot line or a conflicting characterization. So I try to separate out my reading. Uh, and that, that proved really helpful to me <laughs> to go through all, I went through, you know, four or five of her books in the past couple of weeks mm -hmm. as a refuge. Yeah. And how about I'm you? Also, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, no, I love her books too. I read them. I actually, I chain read those when I was up at all hours with my second child, when he was an infant, when there was that Kindle shaped dent in the middle of his head from all those <laughs> 3 a.m. feedings. And I just, you know, I tore through and she has most of her books that seem to be in sort of trilogies or so on. And so I would read through them one by one and just click buy on the Kindle on the next one, yes. like the end. Um, like potato but, chips. But yeah. recently, you know, I've been chain reading Golden Age Mysteries. Although I have to say, you know, and I may need to ask John for advice. I think I'm starting to scrape the bottom of the barrel here. So <laughs> Patricia Wentworth's Miss Silver books got me going through most of the pandemic because yep. they're, you know, it's interesting because I had never heard of them. A friend recommended them and they, they don't have the brilliance of a Josephine Tay or a Dorothy Sayers. Or Niall Marsh. Marsh. Yes, there's something incredibly compelling about them, though, that I think it's because her side characters are so well realized. She writes very believable people and her detectives are kind of like there's no personal growth in her detective, but her side characters are charming. And so now I, I've run out of Miss Silver, so I've been reading Niall Marsh, although I have to confess, yeah. I'm finding Inspector Allen kind of flat. And maybe it's just me, but... I almost feel that he's sort of a weak Peter Whimsy um, replacement. Yeah. And especially yeah. his love interest feels like she's trying to be Harriet Vane, but she's not quite. So anyway, but right now I'm reading um, Elizabeth Daly's Henry Gamage books, which oh, are yes. sort of the American equivalents. I'm finding very enjoyable. They're sort of like Mary Roberts, Rein <laughs> Mary Robert Reinhardt without some of the more objectionable elements. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, if anyone has any recommendations for good series, I am in a bit of a, you know, that reading slump where you just want to find something you can latch on to and read through book after book after book. But well, I don't have a series for you, but have you, have you, you probably have read Michael Innes's Lament for a Maker? No, no, I haven't. <laughs> it is an utterly transportive book and not all of Michael Innes's, but mm -hmm. Lament for a Maker is absolutely wonderful you'll love it oh you'll excellent. absolutely love it because it's like the moonstone it's told by four narrators in succession in four chunks of the book from their each of their perspectives um and it's set in scotland during a ice storm and you'll you'll just love it okay sold i'm writing this down now yeah it's hard to find because it's been yeah. out of print forever but it's it's a book I've reread probably five times. <laughs> but it's always so interesting with those old books that you really love, trying to parse out how much of it is the quality of the book and how much of it is what that book means 
to you because you're attached to it because you read it at a certain moment in time. It means things to you. I always yeah. try to figure out that out when I'm recommending books to people. Yes. There are some like Mary Stewart's Nine Coaches Waiting that I yes. think is objectively a brilliant book. Yes. And then there are others I recommend where I'm like, wait, this holds up for me, but it will not hold up for anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you and I were telepathic because I was about to say Nine Coaches Waiting is for, is for me one of those books. Yes. And I gave it, I gave it to a 10 year old girl I was mentoring and writing a couple of years ago and realized it just did absolutely nothing for her. And I thought, how is this possible? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, maybe, maybe there, you know, it's funny because I have an eight year old daughter and it's been fascinating watching her grow as a reader, but yeah. that growth is very different from my growth. Cause I feel like, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but we had fewer children's books to read. Right. And that I feel like I belong to the pre Harry Potter generation where we progressed through, um, you know, Francis Hodgson Burnett and right. Nancy Drew and Laura Ingalls Wilder, Laura Ingalls Wilder. And Louisa there were Alcott. Yep. Right. Exactly. All of those. An old fashioned girl. And they mm -hmm. were the same books that people had been reading for generations before us. And then there's a break. And my daughter and her friends, they read Keeper of Lost Cities and Harry Potter. And um, oh, gosh, the I'm fantasy blinking. The element is huge. The whole fantasy dystopic projected reality is, is the difference. And there's it's a very not, different sensibility. And I think right. it leads to a very different sort of reading by and by, which is not a bad thing. It's just, it's very different. And she reacts to books differently than I do because her literary underpinnings are different. Right. It's fascinating. Like what makes a reader and what makes a certain type of reader? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And generationally. Yes, because yeah. I think generationally we react to um, Mary Stewart as we do because we grew up in Newell Street Field and they just, those lead seamlessly one to the other. Yeah, yeah. All right, last question before we head out tonight. Um, we've been talking about your recent releases. Can you guys tell us what you have got coming up next? Let's start with Stephanie. Uh, let's see. So I just turned in my latest Nantucket book. I will be writing um, another Jane in the coming year, which is probably the last Jane. Um, I have just signed an option agreement to do streaming. Uh, I'm not sure about that, not allowed. <laughs> um, but I'm hoping that that's, that's something that happens. We'll see, you know, often, so, I often can't do this when it never actually comes to fruition. So we'll, we'll hope. Fingers crossed. So as um, soon as you said option, so as soon as Sorry? you said option, as soon as you said option agreement, you completely froze. So we didn't get any of that after you said option agreement. I was wondering if that was like the official super yeah. CIA. <laughs> yeah, it's the CIA coming in. Um, so what I said before I was muted uh, forcibly um, is that I just signed an option agreement with a UK showrunner to develop the Jane series for streaming television, Ooh. but I can't say which or whom because uh, that has not been yeah. put out by them yet. And I was saying, you know, these things, you sign things and they don't necessarily mm -hmm. happen, but I hope, mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that this will. So, cause it, I've reached a point where, you know, I don't know if you thought about this, but I look at something like Anne Cleves' work and she's, had this dilemma, I imagine, where the writers have taken over her two of her series, um, the Vera series and the Shetland series, mm -hmm. and uh, they are writing the episodes for those. So they are detached from her work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really challenging situation to be in. Whereas if, as I assume I will have done, I finished the Jane series with the next book. I'm at a point where I will feel comfortable turning it over to someone else to interpret differently. Yes, that makes perfect sense. So, yeah. so we'll see. I want to hear about the about your next work and about um, the Newport book. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you know, Band of Sisters comes out in paperback on March 1st. Mm -hmm. um, and I am currently working on the book that will not die. I'm on my second round of revisions for the prequel to that book, which is about the founder of the Smith College Relief Unit, but in her youth as this plucky Smith grad in 1896, who goes off to Greece to be an archaeologist and is told women can't dig. 
And so, of course, to show the guys, winds up nursing in the Greco-Turkish War, and then from there somehow winds up entangled in the Spanish-American War. So it's this book I've been joking wow. about calling Two Wars and a Wedding. Um, but <laughs> It's like all the wars, all the drama, all the late 19th century history no one knows about. Because I'm like, Greco Turkish War. And everyone's like, what's that? Um, but yeah, that book, that book, it does not have a title yet because I am resisting the urge to call it Two Wars at a Wedding. If anyone has title ideas, I, you know, I got nothing. Um, but that book is coming That's out. That's hilarious. That's wonderful. Oh, and in the meantime, my next Team W book with Beatrice Williams and Karen White comes out on May 17th. And that one's called The Lost Summers of Newport. It's three time periods. It's present day during a mansion makeover show gone very, very wrong in which this poor old Newport mansion is being you know, pulled apart and its secrets revealed. Uh, the 1950s, the year of the um, Tiffany Ball. So mm -hmm. the Kennedys put in an appearance. And the 1890s, when a robber barred heiress is being thrown at the head of an Italian prince to try to legitimate the family money. And so that's Fabulous. That book is coming out um, in May. And hopefully we'll be at murder by the book for real. We'll see what happens. Yay. Wouldn't that I be just, fabulous? Yeah. I just I did... I just did an event request on the publisher grids for it today. We get lists of people, publishers, but this is what we've got coming out. So just did a big event request on it today. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Well, and you know, the, the event request is coming from our side too, where we're like, but we have to go there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they don't always listen to us. You know, they just book our flights and send us places. And we're like, wait, that's where we're going? <laughs> yeah. All right. Wonderful. So so to recap for anyone who might have tuned in late, we have been chatting with Stephanie Barron, whose newest book, uh, Jane in the Year Without a Summer, has just come out on Tuesday. And with Lauren Willig, who's, as she mentioned, her book, Band of Sisters, comes out in paperback at the beginning of March. If you missed any part of our chat, Facebook and YouTube will archive them, so you'll be able to go back and rewatch. You'll also be able to go back and rewatch the chat that we did with Lauren uh, last year when Band of Sisters came out. We chatted with her and Dana Rayburn and Tasha Alexander. And Stephanie, I feel like you chatted with an author for us fairly recently, too. Did you chat with maybe James James Ben? Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. So yeah. there's so there's also a chat with uh, her and uh, James Ben up on the Stories YouTube channel as well. So hope that you guys will check those out. Um, I dropped links to their books um, that they've been chatting about this evening and the books that they talked about that they've read recently in the order comment or in the uh, comments on Facebook and YouTube, if anybody is curious about those. Um, so uh, Lauren, it was so great to see you. Stephanie, it was so great to, to get to meet you even virtually. Thank you so much for doing this with us this evening. Lauren, thank you for your time and your energy and your wonderful questions. It was such a treat to talk to you tonight and to you, John. Thank you for your wonderful books. These have been, you know, the joy of my life for the past 20 years. And I hope I will be reading things you write for at least another 20 years more. Well, I, you know, that sentiment is absolutely returned, my dear. So thanks so much. I'll have a good night. Goodbye, everyone.